So, good morning. As you can see, we are going to run a videotape today in the hopes that we can get the quality of the videotapes a little bit better, okay? You could still ask questions. Just pretend it's not even there, <laughs> okay? The only thing that I'll be checking every once in a while is that it's still taping, so you'll see me pop over there, or maybe you could even check yeah. every once in a while and make sure that it's recording, okay? I know the quality of the tapes hasn't been great. Hopefully we can substitute these in and we'll have a little bit better quality. So for the tape today, we're gonna to finish up nervous tissue. We have to go over what's called the synapse. Then we'll be moving into central nervous system for um, the lecture, the full lecture today. Now, any questions before we start? Okay, excellent. So, for posterity, this may not apply in the future, but for us in this section this year, fall of 2017, next Monday is what? Columbus Day, okay? So we don't have class again next week. All right, it's kind of cool, kind of not. You'll have to do work at home. What I'm assigning to you to do at home is skin, but also watch your emails, because I believe we have a test coming up in the near future, okay? So check your emails, make sure you watch skin, and take the quiz for that, all right? So any questions before we start? Is it the skin quiz due by tomorrow night? It is, yeah. So that's all we have to do for this week? Well, look at your next email. <laughs> okay, all right, any other questions? Excellent, okay. So I have to stay in the front of the room, so I don't want you talking. Okay, if you have questions in the back, ask me, okay? So, we're gonna move on to synapse. Do you guys know anything about synapses yet? <coughs> okay, here we go. So synapses are going to be where a nerve talks to another nerve, where a nerve talks to a gland, where a nerve talks to a muscle, where a nerve talks to an organ. Okay, so what's the basic gist of a synapse? A nerve telling something to do something, okay? We focus mostly on a nerve talking to a muscle. It's one of the most studied synapses. It's one of the easiest ones to understand. So that's what we'll mostly be talking about. Are there other synapses? Absolutely. The other thing that we're going to talk about is the fact that it's a chemical synapse. So if it's chemical, it must have what going into the synaptic space? A chemical of some oh that was a good that was a good that was like a trigger response now isn't it ATP right <laughs> a chemical of some sort okay mostly you're gonna hear acetylcholine that's what we're gonna talk about today all right are you with me okay so shooting the bullseye okay this is kind of just like a cool little picture. And the reason that I put this picture up is so you can see those chemicals coming down. They're going to be expelled by the process of exocytosis. Remember we talked about that, spitting things out into the space and they'll be attaching to whatever they're going to. In this case, we'll talk about skeletal muscles. Does that make sense? So you're sending a chemical from a nerve to the receptor, which can be anything, but we're gonna talk about it being skeletal muscle. Okay, I wish I had the little remote thing to do here. Okay, so you can see here, you can go an axon to a dendrite, an axon to cell bodies, an axon to axon, don't worry about that. Okay, just understand the basic concepts and steps of, <laughs> is that wire? <laughs> Bless you. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> We're going to study it as an axon going to a skeletal muscle, okay? So, like I said before, too, we have electrical, but we're going to mostly talk about chemical, okay? Ones that releases chemicals from one to the other, all right? So think about this for a second. If we have a nerve talking to a muscle, okay, what would be the space? Does anybody know what that space is called? It's called a synapse. Okay, so the space, that's okay, between the nerve and the muscle is a synapse. Are you with me? 
So where would the presynaptic membrane be? Before, and it would be on the what? Yes. It would be on the axon. So we have an axon coming down and talking to a skeletal muscle, right? So the presynaptic membrane is going to be on the axon. The postsynaptic membrane is on the what? Muscle. Does everybody understand that? Okay, and the reason we name it pre and post is because specific things are released from the presynaptic membrane and travel to the postsynaptic membrane. Are you with me? So we want to know the names of those surfaces. Are you with me? Okay, so presynaptic, postsynaptic. Does that make sense? Okay, and then we'll be talking about chemicals as I spoke about earlier. Is everybody clear? So this is the picture that we'll be looking at. I'm going to talk to you about every single step, how this chemical is released. It will be released into that synaptic cleft is the specific name of the space itself. It will attach to the skeletal muscle on receptors. Are you with me? Okay. Now the whole overall goal of this, just think for a minute, you already know the answer to this. How do we send signals down the axon? Begins with an A. An action potential. So think, I'm, I'm stepping back. We're going to go into the specifics of the synaptic cleft and what happens there. But we have an action potential come down the nerve. That action potential signals the release of those chemicals. Those chemicals attach to the muscle on the postsynaptic membrane. Are you with me? And what happens to that muscle? It now undergoes an action potential. Are you with me? Yes, no? Yes, no? Okay. That's like the whole general gist of what we're going to talk about. Okay, now we need to talk about the specific steps that happen at that synaptic cleft. Okay? So presynaptic membrane, synaptic cleft, postsynaptic membrane. Axon, skeletal muscle. Cool? Okay. Any questions so far on any of that? It's all a piece of cake after that. <clears throat> uh, we talked about it being a chemical synapse. Those chemicals are known as neurotransmitters. Okay, they'll be released from the presynaptic membrane and attached to that postsynaptic membrane. Okay, now on the postsynaptic membrane, it's going to open ion channels. I want you to think about that for a minute. What are those ion channels? They are protein channels, and what passes through them to create an action potential? Yeah, and some, in, oh, potassium, you said. I thought you said calcium for a minute, which is true in some cases. Potassium and sodium. Do you see where we're going with this? If we send that signal down to the skeletal muscle and we open up those protein channels, sodium and potassium can cross over. When we move a lot of sodium and potassium, it can create an, what? Action potential. Are you guys with me? Yes? Does that make sense? Okay. Can I just repeat that? Again? Absolutely. When we release neurotransmitter from the presynaptic membrane and it attaches to the protein channels of the postsynaptic membrane, it opens sodium and potassium channels, which allow the action potential to happen. Right? Yes? And then we have all those crazy steps with the action potential. <clears throat> which if you don't remember it, review it. Is this making sense? I'm kind of saying the same thing in different ways a couple times. Okay? okay? I have a little movie there. The link doesn't work anymore. I apologize. Okay. So, this is why I kind of did this last week. Okay. Do you remember what graded potentials are? We spoke about action potentials last week, right? And with the full action potential. Or graded potential with graphs. What? Graded potential with a graph. Yeah, on that graph. Remember on the graph, we talked about a resting cell. Mm -hmm. What's the charge on a resting cell membrane? Mm -hmm. Negative 70, right? So this is time. You know, in milliseconds, this is millivolts, you know, the voltage. 
a resting cell is negative 70. Cells are like little people, right? Do they stay the same all the time? No. They let some ions in and some ions out. So if that happens, we can have a slight change in the charge without it becoming an action potential. Are you with me? Does everybody understand that? Those are graded potentials. Which one of these, number one or number two, gets this cell closer to an action potential? One, right? Because to perform an action potential, it must become positive to negative 50. At negative 50, it reaches threshold, it'll undergo an action potential. Which one takes it away? Does everyone understand that? Which one takes it away from an action potential? Two, right? Because it makes it more negative. I'll go down to like negative 90, I think is, is the range generally. And that takes it further from performing an action potential. Is it an action potential 50? That's threshold. There's different numbers with the action potential. The resting cell membrane is negative 70. Threshold is negative 50. It'll peak at positive 30 at that point. <laughs> Just to refresh your memory. All right, and then it goes back down and it dips below negative 70, et cetera. Okay. The reason I'm showing this to you, and let me preface this conversation with I don't do drugs, which I don't, okay, A. B, I don't teach drugs at all. I've never been taught drugs. I would, you know, as a chiropractor, I'm more of a holistic practitioner. But I do want you to understand that if you have a medication that moves it up, it'll move it closer to an action potential and will cause a stimulation in that nerve, like epinephrine. If you have a drug that moves it down, like a muscle relaxant, it moves it further from depolarization and an action potential. Okay, so I know somewhere along the line you'll have to understand that concept as well. Are you with me? Okay? And that's a jumble of gobbledygook. Does anyone have any questions? Sort of kind of makes sense? All right, cool. So, excitatory would depolarize and move it closer to an action potential. Hyperpolarization moves it away from an action potential. Okay? Okay. So neurotransmitters can be excitatory or inhibitory, okay, dependent upon the receptors. That's as far as we'll go with that. Okay, could be excitatory, could be inhibitory, but it also depends on the receptors. You can use different neurotransmitters, and there's a whole bunch of them, guys. We're not going to study all of them. I'll pick and choose what we need as we go. Okay. This is one concept you should understand, though. Neurotransmitters will fit into specific receptors. So not every neurotransmitter will affect everything. Not every neurotransmitter will affect everything. That would be crazy, because every time you released a neurotransmitter, it would affect everything in the body. It's very receptor specific. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying with that? The other thing to understand is there are some neurotransmitters that will be accepted by multiple receptors and they may have different effects. Does that make sense as well? Yes, okay, all right. So it could be either, you know, excitatory or inhibitory depending on the receptor. Now neurotransmitters are short-lived, right? Think about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, I know you don't know this yet, but it stimulates muscles, skeletal muscles. So if you had acetylcholine get onto the receptors of skeletal muscles and it didn't release, they would keep contracting, right? They've got to be short-lived. They do their job and they go away or dissipate. And I'll show you how that happens in a little bit. Okay? So, and I'll show you right now, as a fact, they're either reabsorbed. Okay? So this can happen. Can you picture, take for a second, can you picture that synaptic cleft that we just drew? Well, I didn't draw it. I don't draw anymore because you know how I draw, right? It can be released from, like, a stick figure is all I got in my wheelhouse, right? 
it can be released from the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane and just be reabsorbed in the presynaptic membrane. Okay? It can be destroyed. Okay? We have a enzyme that we're gonna an enzyme that we're gonna talk about a little bit called acetylcholinesterase. Okay? Guess what that what that's gonna break down? Acetylcholine. Okay? So it can be broken down by enzymes or it can diffuse into circulation. We can actually break it apart into its substrates or smaller parts, and it can be reabsorbed and reused again. I think that's an important concept I was talking about with this student, is within our bloodstream and a little bit in the interstitial tissues, we'll break apart substances that are used to be reused again, like proteins. Once we use an enzyme or a protein, if it breaks down, we'll break it down to amino acids to make more what? Proteins in the future, okay? So we kind of have this pool of substances in our bloodstream that we can make substances from. Are you with me? Okay. It's Monday, isn't it? I should have espresso machine in here. That's a great idea. We'll shout out espresso. Here we go. All right, so neurotransmitters, yes? That'd be nice. That oh, sorry. Okay, so three important neurotransmitters, and we'll start to look at these more specifically in the future as well. Acetylcholine and some of the substances that can inhibit them, actually, I put up here too. Okay, so acetylcholine is a big one. This is, I think, the most studied. This is the one that we find between axons and skeletal muscles that make our skeletal muscles work. Botulism, okay, does anybody know where we use botulism medicinally speaking? Oh, I, I guarantee you've seen the ad for it. Botox? Yeah, Botox. It's a derivative, I don't know, don't do drugs once again, but it's a derivative of botulism, which is a substance that you can find in nature. We see it in, like, um, have you ever heard that you should never eat from a can that's like exploded, right? It can have botulism in it. And the problem with botulism is, I don't know if it's a bacteria or a virus, to be honest with you, it's not in my wheelhouse once again, but it can cause paralysis. And what it likes to cause paralysis is of the diaphragm. And our diaphragm is our primary muscle of what? Breathing, right? So is that a good thing? No, that's bad. Okay, so botulism is bad. But they've taken this chemical derivative of it, and what do we do with it in Botox? <coughs> Have you ever seen? I just ran into somebody. I'm not going to say who. You wouldn't know who anyway. I haven't seen her for 10 years. And she had her lips done, and I'm positive she had Botox, because when she saw me, she was like, oh, there is you, how are you? I haven't seen you for so long. Well, guess what, she's had a ton of. She had a ton of Botox. You can't make facial expressions if you've had too much of it. The other interesting thing is they used to say there's no side effects to it, but it can, possibly travel on the nasal mucosa and back to the brain, I think, in that way, or maybe it's the optic nerve, I forget one of those, but anyway, I don't know. I'll take my wrinkles, you know, anyway. So, botulism curare is a substance, I think it comes from frogs, that they can do to, um, you know, people who live like in the forest can put on their arrows and then shoot either prey or enemies with it and it can paralyze them, yeah, craziness, right? Okay, norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that we will study when we talk about sympathetic nervous system. What is the sympathetic nervous system? What's the buzzword for it? Bite or flight, okay? Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that will facilitate those actions of the sympathetic nervous system. We're gonna go all into that in a few slides, as a matter of fact. No, maybe a couple weeks, actually, okay? Dopamine. <clears throat> Dopamine is a neurotransmitter um, that works in the brain, and it helps to calm us down, but it is also the neurotransmitter that is decreased in people with Parkinson's. Do we know what Parkinson's is? Yeah. Some yeses, some noes. 
Parkinson's is a di disease where in their basal nuclei in their brain, which are some of those deep gray matter areas of the brain that coordinate motion, decrease in levels of dopamine compared to someone who doesn't have Parkinson's. And they have very stereotypical presentations. Does anybody know what those are? Shaking. Shaking. Yeah, it's called resting tremors, and it's called, re is this in here? Oh, it's in here in the future. Just listen, okay? I'll teach about Parkinson's in the future. Just listen. Resting tremors, because when they start to move, what happens to those tremors? They stop, right? They have what's called mask-like facies, because they can't make facial expressions anymore. And they very, they'll talk to you like this and not smile and not respond. It's not that they're not interested. It's just that they can't make faces. And they also have what's called a stooped gait. Does anyone live in New Hartford? Have you seen a guy who, I walk on Genesee, by the way. If you ever see the crazy lady with dogs and kids and stuff, that's me. I have a little black and white dog. But I mean, do you ever see that guy walk down Genesee and he always walks like this? Oh, I have one. He has Parkinson's, which is that breaking your butt? He's not a patient of mine. No. Anyway, right? Oh, no. Sorry if I just broke him on. Have you seen him? And he always has gloves and a hat on, even when it's hot. Like maybe he has Renaud's too. He has some, I want to see he has something on his ears. But anyway, you know who I mean, and he looks like he's going to fall. He, I'm pretty sure he has Parkinson's. I mean, he's not a patient of mine. I'm not sure. It's not a definitive diagnosis, but he looks like he has Parkinson's. They have that real stooped gait because they have difficulty feeling where their feet are going. So they feel like they're going to fall, so they lean forward and they slap their feet down to make sure that they're not falling forward. Okay, so Parkinson's. Well, there's others as well, guys. Um, ATP, nitrous oxide, serotonin. Um, you know, this is a list. I would never ask you at this point to know the laundry list. I like to teach you the neurotransmitter as we go so you can affiliate it with structures. All right, I better get a move on here. Okay, so cocaine. cocaine. Cocaine increases dopamine in pleasure centers of the brain, okay? And what it does is it binds and blocks the presynaptic membrane so it can't be reabsorbed. So if you can picture again that synaptic membrane, the dopamine will stay in that synaptic membrane. If it stays in that synaptic membrane in those pleasure centers, what does it keep doing? Stimulating the sense of pleasure, okay? Interestingly enough. Now, when you do that, your nurse said, cool, we have more dopamine. We're going to increase the number of receptors on the postsynaptic membrane in that pleasure center. So if you increase the amount of receptors, what happens when you stop doing cocaine? You crave it, right? Because your body is like, I have more receptors, I need more dopamine, I need more cocaine. And it starts again, and the cycle continues, right? And that's why it's so addicting, okay? So um, just don't start, right, is the way to deal with that one. Go out for a run. It's addicting because you get more receptors. Yeah, you get most more receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, so the area of that feel-good center, and it's going to want more. That's why I tell my kids all the time, just don't even start, right? Don't start smoking, don't start doing drugs, because it's very addicting, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. I don't know. I just thought these were cool pictures. If you want to check them out, of course, I would never test you on them. Cool. All right. So, can neurotransmitters can be broken down with enzymes? I think we already spoke about this. Can be reabsorbed into the presynaptic membrane. It can be diffused and broken down. Okay, into its substrates or smaller parts. All right. Let's crank out a little bit of central nervous system. Okay, now we're going to start central nervous system. So any questions before I start central nervous system on that synaptic cleft? Does it sort of kind of make sense? Yeah, and you know what I was thinking too, this is what I like to do and I didn't go through these steps. Hold on. I'm going to come back to this, all right? And I want to go over the steps really quickly, and then we'll move on.
Okay. Okay, this is how it goes down. I want to see how that looks on the video. My goodness, you can't see it at all. That's okay. I don't want to move it. So I'll talk it through. All right? So we have the presynaptic membrane, which is the axon, right? That's what I have up there, presynaptic membrane. And what will happen is an action potential travels down that axon, okay? So suppose we're gonna make my biceps work. My biceps create this motion at my forearm, right? In action, so I'm gonna go through the steps of how that happens at the synaptic cleft, all right? An action potential comes down that axon, okay? It releases calcium, because this is one step that I left. This will then release calcium, Calcium stimulates these little packets of neurotransmitters that are kept at the end of that axon and tells them to go and be released into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so calcium triggers the release of your neurotransmitter. So we have action potential, come down the axon. Calcium is released towards the end of that axon. The calcium stimulates the neurotransmitter to go to the presynaptic membrane. Are you with me? Okay, and then that is ready to be released into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so then the neurotransmitter is released into synaptic cleft. So first step done, right? Action potential, calcium, neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Are you with me? So is the calcium in the axon? The calcium is in the axon. It's in little vesicles, just like we studied vesicles in chapter three. Okay. It's encapsulated. So the the last two, like the first two steps that you said are happening inside the axon and then it mm -hmm. goes that like leaves Calcium the axon. Calcium and neurotransmitter into. in the axon. So then that leaves and goes into the synaptic cleft. And the neurotransmitter then leaves the end of the axon into the synaptic cleft. I think that was pretty much the same question. Oh, okay. The, so it goes to presynaptic membrane and then to the synaptic cleft. What does? I'm sorry. The neurotransmitter? The neurotransmitter is stored in the presynaptic membrane. And the calcium triggers it to be released, okay. to actually move to the end of that presynaptic membrane to be released into the synaptic <laughs> cleft. The neurotransmitters are encased in vesicles? Yes. Everybody got that now, right? Okay. So what does the neurotransmitter do? Can I erase this? All right, what does the neurotransmitter do now? So the neurotransmitter has been released. It's in the synaptic cleft. <clears throat> neurotransmitter is now in the synaptic cleft. What does it do at that point? But not yet, it's got to do its job first. What's its job? It attaches to, it's something that you mentioned earlier, receptors. receptors. This neurotransmitter now attaches to those protein receptors and turns them on, right? Let's say channels, because I think that's what we've called it quite often. Neurotransmitter attaches to protein channels in the synaptic membrane. The what synaptic membrane? Post. I'm just going to 
put stand <laughs> membrane. All right, postsynaptic membrane and turns that postsynaptic membrane on. In this case, we're talking about skeletal muscle. That skeletal muscle then can undergo an action potential, okay? Stimulating, so protein, neurotransmitter attaches to the protein channels in the postsynaptic membrane, stimulating an action potential. in that skeletal muscle. Who's taking neuro right now outside of this class? For psychology, okay. Who, who is it, just the two of you? Everybody else, just close your ears for a minute. Tons of other things can happen. They'll talk about this with neurotransmitters in the brain and facilitating neurological processes. We're just doing skeletal muscle. Okay, so if you're like, wait a minute, there's a ton more. Okay, all right, turn your ears back on. All right, we're ready? Okay. Does that help? I usually do write that out. Thank you for reminding me, Bailey. Doing those steps. Okay. Helpful? All right. I'm going to take a two-minute break. Okay. We'll put a little music on because then I'm hoping to go straight through nervous system, central nervous system. All right. Are you we are going to now move into... Central nervous system. Okay. Um, some of the anatomical structures I'm going to move through quickly because we're going to really go over them in lab. Okay. And I would like to get through the whole lecture today since we're missing class next week. But as always, if I'm going too fast and something doesn't make sense, let me know. But pretty much the anatomical structures, we're thoroughly going to go over those in lab. Okay. So, central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, right? We already learned that. The brain, <coughs> pardon me, is in the skull. The spinal cord is in what bones? All the vertebral bones, okay? Are you with me? Okay. And they're encased in a nice, hard, bony outer covering because unlike the sheep's brains that we'll dissect in lab, our brain is almost like a thick pudding. It's pretty mushy, okay? Not only do we have the nice hard bones outside of it, we have a really tough layer. It's called a meninges. This probably sounds familiar. Meningitis, right? Meninges. A hard outer covering of the brain as well, and then smaller, thinner inner coverings, okay? So the brain is pretty well protected within those coverings as well as the skull, okay? Spinal cord is pretty delicate too. All nerves really are. If you have damage or pressure to a nerve, they just don't like it because they're kind of pliable. And that pliability is what allows the action potential to go through them, okay? So, um, and we went through action potentials as well. Does that mean you get like pinched nerve? Yeah, yeah, what happens is somehow it gets pinched either by a herniated disc or there's other means as well. Carpal tunnel, right? Where does that happen? Your In your wrists. It's because of a fascial covering over that nerve. It gets damaged and scarred and will press on it. Nerves do not like damage. They'll start actually by being irritated and inflamed so they get like that burning kind of pressure pain. And after a while, they get permanently damaged, and you don't feel that burning pain anymore because now it's permanently numb. <laughs> you so know, I so you don't want to keep that pressure on a nerve. Is that why with like, like cause some of the players on my team, like their shoulders, they get a lot of burning in their shoulders when we swing? It could be. They could also be muscle overuse. There's um, it's called delayed onset of muscle soreness (DOMS). So it could be that. Could be the nerves as well. That's kind of a delicate area. So, uh, all right, cool. So looking at this picture kind of shows you the general overall structure. We're just, look and listen. We're gonna go over every one of these things specifically. We have the two cerebral hemispheres, right? With the gray on the outside that we spoke about last time we met. 
that's all your personality, your feeling, your movement, etc. Then we have white matter just inside of that. And what does white matter do in the brain again? Send signals, receive signals. Deep in the center, in this area, we'll have gray again. That deals with autonomic or automatic functions in that brainstem area in the center of the brain. Okay? We also have spaces in the brain, which we're going to go over the names of that. Any idea what fills those spaces of the brain? Very nice. Cerebral spinal fluid. <coughs> a cerebral spinal fluid is fluid in the brain, in the cavities of the brain, that helps to nourish brain tissue it, and carry wastes away. It acts almost like blood for the central nervous system, providing nourishment and carrying wastes away, just like blood would in the rest of our tissues of our body. Now, why wouldn't we just bathe the brain with blood? Does anybody know this? Brain bleeds are bad. What? Brain bleeds are bad. Brain, brain bleeds are bad. It's a different topic, but do we want bacteria and viruses in the central nervous system? No. Okay. Cerebral spinal fluid is a specific fluid that we derive from our bloodstream to bathe and nourish the brain and the spinal cord. That way we keep that bacteria and viruses out unless there's a disease. Are you with so me? It's pretty much filtered blood. Yeah, it's filtered blood. It's like a not quite clear, a little foggy filtered blood. All right. So not only does cerebral spinal fluid bathe and nourish, it provides a very small amount of cushioning. Not a ton, very small amount. So when you get like the bad brain bleeds or whatever, is that what like it's just on What the happens blood? with now even though cerebral spinal fluid is what feeds and nourishes the brain and the spinal cord, the arteries are right in there in the whole brain region. A brain bleed is one of those arteries busts open. So it's completely different from what we're talking about with the blood, blood brain barrier, but that is bad too, because then that blood can get into the tissues, but more importantly is it's not gonna feed the tissues of the brain beyond it, and you lose oxygen and glucose to those tissues. And we've already mentioned that you need a ton of oxygen and glucose in that brain tissue, right? Mm -hmm. Or it dies off. So, and that's what happens. What would that condition be? A brain bleed. It would cause a, it's a very common term. Somebody who, facial drooping, stroke, stroke. stroke, right? That's one of the mechanisms of a stroke. You can also get a blockage. So a stroke is a brain, a brain bleed? Predominantly, or? it's a blockage. It's a clot. But it could be. It could be. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Now, I just want to point out one more thing before we move on. Does the cerebral spinal fluid go all the way down the spinal cord? According to this picture. No. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's arrows. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it comes down. Don't forget, I think for some reason we get stuck that cerebral spinal fluid is just in the brain. It comes down the spinal cord. When we do a spinal tap to check for infections, where do they do it? Does anybody know? In the low back. Okay, so just to tie that all in together for you. Okay? Protection of the brain, we've got the skull, the vertebra, we've got meninges. Meninges are those layers that I was talking about. The, and I think I get into this in the slides, hold on, I always get ahead of myself. I do, okay, so this is in the notes. So there's three layers. The outer harder covering, this is all in the notes, in the next couple of slides is called dura mater. It actually translates to hard mother, okay, dura mater. <laughs> If I were to take, um, you know, it's fall, we get those big black bags out to put leaves in. It's about as strong as one of those black bags. It's pretty firm. And it anchors up near your nose and all the way down at your sacrum. And it provides an anchoring for the brain and the spinal cord so it can't twist in the bony skull and the bony vertebra. 
It also has a little piece that goes between those two cerebral hemispheres to keep them aligned. There's a whole bunch of little pieces that go in, okay? So dura mater. In from that, so if I take dura mater off, in from that is arachnoid mater. What does arachnoid mean? Arachnid. Spider. Spider. It looks like a spider web. I, I'm telling you, we're going to pin it. We're literally going to put a pin in it. You're going to say, what is that pin in? The pin's in arachnoid matter. It's that thin, okay? We'll show you how to find it in lab. Pia mater is a layer of cells on the brain itself, the outer surface of the brain, okay? Okay. It's important to know and understand that blood vessels will be in that subarachnoid space. Okay, the majority of the blood vessels will be in the subarachnoid space for the brain. Okay, and we'll get into why in a little bit, why that's important. Okay, <coughs> cerebral spinal fluid, oh, we'll get into it now, okay, is between the arachnoid and that pia mater. That's where our cerebral spinal fluid is. So if we get a bleed into that cerebral spinal fluid in that subarachnoid space, if we get some sort of damage, it will be much more of an issue because that's where cerebral spinal fluid is. You can get what's called subdural, which isn't going to be as dangerous of a bleed. There's still some blood vessels in there. Subarachnoid is dangerous, okay, because the cerebral spinal fluid is there. Okay. Cerebral spinal fluid is created in the ventricles or the spaces of the brain and then sent out to the surface of the brain in the spinal cord. So ventricles create this cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. There's, remember I told you there's blood vessels and then right next to it is the cerebral spinal fluid that'll be bathing and nourishing the brain in the spinal cord. There's something called a blood-brain barrier. I never really learned this well when I got my neural education, so I'd like to explain it to you. It's simply a layer of cells that cover those capillaries or those blood vessels in the brain that make very selective choices as to what will come out into the cerebral spinal fluid. So the blood-brain barrier is a layer of cells, it's tight junctions, okay? between those cells so it can make very specific choices as to what is let into the cerebral spinal fluid. Does that make sense? Like people would talk about blood-brain barrier and I think of it being like like a checkpoint like going into Canada. You know what I mean? Like it was one, it's not. It's this layer of cells that create tight junctions on these blood vessels in the brain that are very specific about what's being left out. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, any questions on this? We're gonna go more into the, the meninges. Okay, if you can imagine, this is a great picture, all right. Okay. So if we take this little chunk of the skull, okay, and look at it, we have this skin, uh, we have a layer of connective tissue, don't worry about that. We have the skull, okay? And then we have the dura mater. Now there's actually two layers. There's one layer that attaches it to the bone, okay? It's just like a dense connective tissue layer. And then there's the layer that actually um, begins the part of the meninges. And you don't drive yourself nuts about it, just no dura mater, okay? So we have the dura mater. Just in from that we have what? Arachnoid mater, which looks like what? It looks like a spider web, it really does, okay? Underneath that, they've got those blood vessels. Remember I told you the majority of the blood vessels are there. This is where we'll have that cerebral spinal fluid. And then the pia mater, you can't really see pia mater unless you have a microscope. It's just the cells on the brain itself, okay? Does this help you sort of visualize those meninges a little bit, maybe, okay? <coughs> but then realize they continue down onto the spinal cord as well. Dura, arachnoid, pia, right? Okay, and pia will actually be on the spinal cord itself. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so we like to protect that brain, don't we? Okay.
I'm going to buzz through these. We'll go over them in the lab as well, briefly. Excuse me. So this is Duramater. Okay. I always say meninges. The truest plural is menix. I never use it. I say meninges. I don't know if it's really appropriate or not, but I always have. So it's two layers like I showed you, and it forms that very strong layer. Okay. Now, we know where cerebral spinal fluid is created. Where is it created? Ventricles. And there's different ventricles we'll talk about in a little bit. Right? That's like fresh blood. It's going to have fresh oxygen, fresh nutrients. It's created in the ventricles. Right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> it'll come down, bathes the brain, bathes the spinal cord, and that fresh stuff is used up, right? And now we have what in the cerebral spinal fluid? Waste, right? We need to get rid of it. Are you with me? There are empty spaces called sinuses that collect that used up cerebral spinal fluid. Are you with me? Okay, sinuses will collect that used up cerebral spinal fluid, and it actually puts it back into the venous system into a vein that you're probably familiar with. Vampires bite it. No, carotid is the artery. That's great that you know that though. Begins with a J, jugular. It moves too fast through arteries. You gotta go for the jugular, right? So they put it back into the. Um, and then it goes back into the venous system. So it recycles it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then it gets fresh nutrients again. Goes into the blood vessels of the brain. Goes into cerebral spinal fluid is created in the what? Ventricles. We have fresh cerebral spinal fluid. It goes around the brain and the spinal cord. It comes back to the sinuses, and then it goes into the jugular vein. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's how we circulate that cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. Good. Whew. That's a big one. Okay. So, the, see all the blue structures? Those are the sinuses, guys. Okay, and then they'll actually come back here, they wind around, they go into the jugular vein in the neck region. Can you have a sinus infection? Do they get a completely separate sinus? Sinus in general means opening. When you have a sinus infection, it's the sinuses in your bony skull. And these are truly created by the dura mater. The dura mater kind of folds and separates to create these dural sinuses. That's a good question though. It's good that you're trying to put it together. Okay, so this is actually some dura mater. The dura mater helps to hold these sinuses in place so they can stay straight, collect that wasted cerebral spinal fluid and put it into your jugular veins. Make sense? Cool. Any other questions? All right, cool. Okay, arachnoid, middle layer, web leg, okay. Um, has the subdural space above it, right? So we have dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater. Subdural would be below the dura, above the what? Arachnoid. arachnoid. Subarachnoid would be below the arachnoid, above the what? Pia. Why is subarachnoid worse if we have damage there? there's more blood vessels, right? Okay. Okay. Those spaces are clinically important. Pumater is that layer, okay, of connective tissue that's right on the brain itself. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions? No? Good. Cerebral spinal fluid um, you know, this, the rest of this you can, um, oh, there's one final thing I should talk about. So, we have, um, small capillaries that are in the ventricles themselves that we may or may not see when we dissect the sheep's brains, 
They're called chloride plexus. Okay. Plexus, you should start to realize or recognize as a network. Okay. This is a network of small capillaries in the ventricles that create that cerebral spinal fluid. So chorid plexus. And when we dissect the sheep's brains out, you might see some black substances in the ventricles. That's a chorid plexus. Okay. It's capillaries, small capillaries. Any questions? Barry, we went over, right? It's those layers of cells in those capillaries that are selectively permeable. Okay. Meningitis would be what? When those capillaries get damaged or something goes wrong. Um, the mechanism that I've heard that makes most sense with meningitis is, um, believe it or not, if you go up into your nose, the nerves that sense smell for you are basically open to the environment. So the mechanism that I've heard of infectious agents with meningitis is up through the nose, onto those nasal nerves, and then it winds its way back to the brain. And it can infect the meninges, which is called meningitis, or it can travel into the brain as well, which is called encephalitis. So that's the mechanism that I've heard, because it never made sense to me to go through the capillaries, because it's such tight junctures, um, unless there's trauma to it. But, yeah? Would you be able to get meningitis if you were to go septic, with a, depending on what the disease is you have? Yes, I believe that as well, because that septus, I think, can damage that blood-brain barrier. That's my guess, though. I'm not certain, but that would be my guess. So then what's the difference between bacterial and viral? The infectious agent itself can be bacterial or viral. So yeah. It's like bad news beers, though. You're going to the hospital, you'll be on IV. And that's why they have you do the, uh, the shot now, right? Did, did you have to have the meningitis shot, mm -hmm. I believe, right? For school? Nursing. Is it required? Yeah. Oh, for, for nursing, nursing it's required. Is it required for non nursing? Yeah. It's so required for everyone, right? Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense. It's grouped in with one because it's bacterial and viral. I don't know which one, but it's grouped into one of those two. I don't know which would be, I don't remember but with, an, with a, an allergic reaction, you release histamine, which is a potent vasodilator, which would also change the shape of those cells creating the blood-brain barrier. So it would be my guess once again. It's not my specialty, but good. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. So. Um, here's a nice picture showing those meninges and those layers. <laughs> also, it gives you a nice visual of the vertebral body and where the spinal cord comes down through that vertebral foramen or opening. And if you really look at that, we have a model up in class that we'll look at in central nervous system. There's not a lot of room to play. It's very tight. In addition to it being tight on the model, keep in mind in a living human being, there's a nice fat pad in there too. So you can see how if you herniate a disc, there's not a lot of room or give. That's why we have so many cases of problems with herniated discs. Okay, spinal cord. I call it the train tracks. Okay, why would I call it the train tracks? Hmm? It's what it looks like. It's what it looks like. It's a travel stop. Sort, I guess. It's a pathway. Maybe like a tube. Right? Like Maybe like a subway. It's got like multiple stops. Multiple stops and multiple transmissions, right? All the time. 
Its primary job is to send and transmit or send and receive information to structures, right? Okay, that's why I call it the train tracks. Um, it's about the diameter of your thumb. Protected by the spinal cord, we went over that. Just like the brain, we'll have areas of gray matter in the spinal cord. That's where we do what? Process information. In the spinal cord, you're like, why would we process information there? It's reflexive. In the spinal cord, we have gray matter to provide reflexive responses, but we also have multiple nerves along a track, if that makes sense. Have you guys studied tracks? Okay. Tracks, in general, are going to be the nerves that bring sensory information into the brain and motor information out. You already know one aspect of tracks, so these are spinal tracks, okay? When I sense something on the right side of my body, where do I sense it in my brain? Left. Left. If I move my right arm, which side of my brain controls that motion? Left. Left. It crosses over. There's one or two exceptions. We're not going to get into all of them, okay? All right? Along that pathway from my left brain to my right arm is multiple nerves. Okay? That's another thing to know and understand. And that's almost as far as we're going to go with that. Okay? All right? All right. So here's a transverse or horizontal cut of the spinal cord. And in the center, we have this butterfly-shaped what? What matter? Gray matter. That's where we'll process information. Remember I told you it's multiple nerves, right? This is going to be the cell bodies of those nerves. Surrounding it is what type of matter? White matter. In that white matter, we'll do what? Well, gray matter processes, white transmits. Are you with me with that? Okay. Are you with me? Okay. And don't forget the spinal cord's a tube, right? Okay, so this gray matter is not horizontal in the white matter, it's a tube. So it'll go up and down that white matter. Are you with me? Okay, yeah. Okay, so command center on the right. So we use action potentials, we know that. It helps to integrate and send that information, okay, of the brain we're talking about. Three major divisions, hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain. We're going to look at all three of those, okay? Let me look at my notes really quick. Hold on. Okay, so here, I like this picture. Um, I think it's a nice way to sort of uh, break stuff down, and I'm very visual, so it helps me. Okay, so um, forebrain is going to be um, from here up. It's going to be thalamus. We're going to go over each one of these and what they do. Thalamus, corpus callosum, and cerebrum. I'm just going to go through the parts. We're going to go through what they all do in the notes. Okay? High brain. Um, so forebrain is like you. Your personality, how you move, how you walk, how you talk, how you see. Okay? I always think of it as being like you. Your personality. Okay? Now, midbrain is going to be this little segment here. This helps coordinate movement and also reflexive vision and auditory. Your personality, how you see and process and talk is really in the forebrain. We've got a reflexive center in the midbrain. Let me tell you briefly what that does. If somebody were to come in and scream, run, there's a bear, okay, and they're standing over there, would we all just keep going on as normal and looking at each other? What's your reflexive response? You hear it, or better yet, let's say a noise. They come in and they, I don't know, scream, right? Okay, you hear it, and what's your reflexive response? You just did it. You to look. You gotta look, right? It's reflexive. Why is it reflexive? 
And your body needs to know whether to run, fight, or hide, right? So in the midbrain, we have this reflexive auditory visual response center. So it's different from the forebrain. So okay. it's kind of flight. It's right, yeah. It's part of fight or flight, per se. Okay. Now, hindbrain is all, uh, you know, like heart rate, these like kind of like caveman kind of things that we've had forever. Okay. So hindbrain. We're going to go through each of these. Like I said, I just wanted to do a visual. I think this picture is a nice visual. Okay. So hindbrain, primitive. Where's a caveman? Um, we have, we have it broken down. Medulla oblongata, we're going to look at medulla oblongata in lab. It's the last part of the brainstem before we get to the spinal cord. We're going to look at it, okay? Cerebellum, we're going to look at, and then pons as well. Um, so you get that visual. But these are towards the bottom of the brain that I showed you earlier, okay? Medulla oblongata does a lot of autonomic functions. I won't read them to you. They're listed there. Okay, medulla oblongata is a very important structure. It's also where a lot of those fibers crisscross. Do you guys have a question? Um, cardiovascular. Cardiovascular, sorry about that. Okay, it's where the fibers crisscross for motor control. Okay, so remember I told you right brain controls left body. Where those nerves cross over is at the medulla oblongata. It's a more specific name if you learned it in psych, but that's where we're gonna learn. Okay, medulla oblongata. Now, cerebellum is kind of this um, lumpy, lumpy thing at the base of the brain back here, and that helps to coordinate your movements, especially for learned things, um, like driving, okay, or playing an instrument. The cerebellum, walking. Okay, cerebellum is affected when you've had too much to drink, right? You can't walk as well, you can't move as well. Okay, so cerebellum helps to coordinate that. Pons, we'll see, is in the front middle portion of the brain, and it helps to coordinate rate and rhythm of breathing. Okay, rate and rhythm of breathing. And it's one of those center courses for the brain and the spinal cord. Um, it helps with set, um, something else, but we'll get into that a little bit. Okay? So a hindbrain towards the back. Okay. Now, if we look at this, just trying to bring oh, good. some clinical stuff in there. Okay. What are we looking at in this x-ray? Mm -hmm. The neck, which would also be known as the what spine? Mm -hmm. Cervical spine. Somebody who um, has been in a car accident with severe whiplash, this may happen, okay, might get a break in C2. Okay, so the break is right here. Now C2 is going to be about where your medulla oblongata is. So if you have damage there or misplacement of that vertebra, it can push on the medulla oblongata. What would it do to cardiovascular and breathing, et cetera? It could shut them down. Okay. That's why it's so important if somebody has had, had a neck trauma to make sure that they don't have a fracture. If this patient somewhat breaks it and then continues with their daily activities and it fully breaks, they could be paralyzed as well as losing control of breathing you know, cardiovascular functions, etc. Okay, so it's called a hangman's fracture because this is theoretically where it fractures when they're hung or when people were hung, I should say. Um, and th this is crazy. I mean, you may never see this, I hope, in your lifetime, but I had two patients who were hung when I was in my chiropractic practice. And the reason I share stories like this is because. I would learn these things and think, I'll never see anybody who was hung. One was lynched, and then God survived, and the other one was playing in a tree as a child and had a rope, and someone got it around his neck and was hung. Two. And two patients were hung. So was I going to go crack in their necks? Absolutely not. They went out for CAT scans to make sure, x-rays to make sure that they were okay. Okay, so you never know. You never know. But this is why I share these nuggets of knowledge with you. Okay? All right.
Moving on. Midbrain. We went over this. Okay, midbrain, seeing and hearing that reflexive response. It's in the middle of the brain. Midbrain. Okay. Forebrain. Emotions and conscious thought, complex behavior. But we also have a sort of automatic things in here as well that helps you control homeostasis. We have a hypothalamus and thalamus. I have more on these a little bit as a separate. Okay. Hypothalamus deals with hunger, thirst, temperature center, as well as sexual awareness is in the hypothalamus. If you have a patient that starts to exhibit problems with those things, they might have some sort of tumor in that region. Thalamus processes sensation from the body. We have this all in the notes. I'm just buzzing through it really quick. Okay? Emotions and memories are found in a series of structures which are called the limbic system, and then the cerebrum are the left and right cerebral hemispheres. I'm going to come, let me see something for just a second. I want to give you a visual, if you're a visual person, I kind of jumped ahead on this, of these structures. Okay? So, we have the two cerebral hemispheres. There's a right and left, separated by a fissure we'll study in lab. Okay? The outside of those cerebral hemispheres is what type of tissue? Gray or white? Gray. Gray. Right? That's your personality, you, how you see, how you think, how you remember. Just deep to that, we have white, which will transmit information from place to place and side to side. Deeper inside of that, we have what again? Gray matter. And that deals with those automatic functions that help us to breathe, keep the heart rate going, etc. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Okay? So, we have... This is the midbrain. These two bumps help with that vision auditory reflex. Here's the cerebellum that helps with coordinating movement. We also transmit motor function through this midbrain as well. Here's the pods. I always think of the pods as being a big, fat, pregnant belly. When I was pregnant with one of my kids, I'm like, oh, that's me, right? Okay. I always, it looks in a human brain, not so much a sheep's brain, like a big, fat, pregnant belly. Okay. Here is the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is almost like indescribable. It's just a widened area below the pons before it narrows down to the spinal cord. Okay? Are you with me? Medulla oblongata. Almost looks like a V. Now, this round structure is the thalamus. Okay? And the thalamus is going to help to send and transmit and decide where sensory information goes, coming from the body and the face up to the brain. Okay, are you with me? Does it help to give a couple visuals of these structures? Okay, got the cart in front of the horse a little bit. Okay, so going back through the notes then. Hindbrain we talked about, famous fracture, midbrain, forebrain. So, thalamus we talked about, we looked at that round structure. Hypo means what? Below. The hypothalamus is an area that is below the thalamus. It's like a kind of nondescript area below the thalamus, but we know it's right below it by its name. Okay? Limbic system, we'll look at, there are several structures in the lim limbic system that we'll look at in the future. That's emotions and memory. Cerebrum, the right and left cerebral hemispheres, which we looked at. Okay, does it help a little bit by giving you a visual? Okay, good. I know I'm very visual. And then we'll go over this again in lab. Okay. On the brain itself, we have this. And what does this do again? I've mentioned it once or twice, especially in my lab people. Increases surface area. The raised areas of the brain are called gyri, is plural. Gyrus is singular. The sulci are the indentations. That is plural, so kiss is singular, okay? So we have all these raised and depressed areas on the brain that help to increase surface area. There's deeper grooves which are called fissures, excuse me, when we look at the brain itself, there's a long fissure 
between the right and the cerebral hemispheres, which is called longitudinal fissure, but there's also deeper sulci, which we have named, which we'll go over in lab. Okay. Now there's five lobes. I have a picture of this. We'll look at, is it next, the picture? No? Let's, okay, let's look at this. <clears throat> Frontal is towards the front. It's separated from the parietal lobe by what's called the central sulcus. Okay, so this is my longitudinal fissure separating my right and left cerebral hemispheres. And then there's a central sulcus coming down about here that separates frontal from parietal. Okay, I'll ask you what um, lobes a hat would sit on. I try to think of stupid questions <laughs> to try to get you to remember that would be parietal. Near my temples would be temporal. Near my occiput would be occipital. God bless you. If you separate, there's a lateral sulcus. If you separate that and look inside, there's a structure called the insula. Okay? I don't think it's up here. All right? So those are the different lobes we're going to look at in lab. Okay? So central sulcus will separate frontal from parietal. Um, the central sulcus, that, let me go over that quickly, because that's a tough one in lab. Okay. What did I tell you this sulcus was? Central sulcus. What lobe is in front of the central sulcus? Frontal. What lobe is behind the central sulcus? Right. Okay. Just listen, don't write this down, it's right in your notes. If I were to ask you, between this one and this one, these are two gyri, which one is the pre-central gyrus? My index finger or my middle finger? Pre-central gyrus. Yeah, pre-central gyrus is the gyrus that is in front of the central sulcus. Post-central gyrus is this one. So we have pre-central gyrus, central sulcus, post-central gyrus. Does that make sense? The reason I want you to know these is one is motor, one is sensory. Okay, pre-central is motor, post-central is sensory for the whole body. Are you with me? So this pre-central gyrus is what again? Motor or sensory? Motor. This is motor to what side of my body? Left. Left. This precentral gyrus. And what lobe is the precentral gyrus in? Uh -huh. Very good, frontal lobe. This precentral gyrus controls motor to what side of my body? Right. Right. I'm going over it slowly because people get confused. This postcentral gyrus does what? Brings in sensory. sensory. It'll be sensory to this side of the body. This postcentral gyrus is going to be sensory from this side of the body. So the postcentral gyrus is sensory. sensory. Whew, does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Why is it important to know these functions? You have to be able to know what makes you move and like what makes you yeah, you have to know it so you know what normal is, and if you know what normal is, you can really tell what what is. Abnormal. Abnormal. You'll see it. You'll get your first diseased patient, well, not diseased patient, but you know what, patient with a disease, and you'll be like, boom. Because guess what? When you're going through nursing or pre-med or PT or whatever, you're doing out on each other. You're all normal, and you all have nothing wrong with you. And when your first patient comes in with your problem, you're like, woo. Really think of me when that happens. You're like, woo, right? You can really tell what a problem is. All right? So it's important to know normal so you can tell what abnormal is. All right. Oh, there's so much good brain. Holy crap. Okay, so that's what this whole gobbledygook is. Central sulcus separates pre from post central gyrus. Okay? Longitudinal fissure separates those two hemispheres. Transverse cerebral uh, fissure is the fissure between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Okay? It's just where they're all separated. Okay. Does that make sense? 
we'll go over this all in lab as well to reiterate it. Okay. So cerebral cortex, this is what makes our personality, memory, abstract thought, conscious awareness, and control. Okay. Um, so to give you kind of the, this is just everything that we've talked about, but sort of summarized a little bit. Okay, we have the cerebral hemispheres. The thalamus, hypothalamus, is something called the epithalamus, which we haven't talked about. All together is known as the diencephalon. Okay, it's sort of like an overall name of thalamus, hypothalamus, and what's known as the pineal gland, which we'll talk about in the future. The brain stem is going to be midbrain pons and medulla oblongata. So that's kind of like the three major groupings of the areas of the brain. Well, I don't have this in the beginning, I have no idea. I think actually I need to explain to you hypothalamus and thalamus first to show you those subdivisions. Okay? You guys need a break, don't you? Two minute break. Let me get back here. Let's fire up. I want to remind you that, okay, and this may vary if we keep these tapes for future people, but for fall of 2017, they go an exam in two weeks. Okay? It's going to, don't forget, cover the rest of, that's going to be week eight already. When you come back after, this big smile just came onto his face. It's week eight already. If it did, he was like, oh, week eight. All right. Yeah, week eight. You did, you did. I saw you. It was like a little bit of That's okay. It's going to be the rest of tissues, which you should know like the back of your hand by now, because of lab. It's only 10 questions, guys, on skin like easy questions on skin. The nervous tissue we completed last week, and then central nervous system, I'll tell you where we're stopping today. I'll also send you an email, all right? Um, please remember to come at the same time and location that you did last time. If you need to change it, send me an email. I'll send a reminder, okay? What is, what is this? I'm sorry, what? What is this? When is it? Two weeks from today. Two It never lets up, sorry. <laughs> I'd love to tell you it gets easier, but it doesn't. All right, let's focus so we can get through the rest of this. All right? Oh dear, it's gonna be tight. All right, you may have to watch some of this at home. All right. All right, so we went through the lobes of the brain, those different locations. This is good because we'll go through, this picture is good because it gives you a general idea of what happens in each one of those areas, okay? But we're going to step through some of those. The ventricles, okay? Connected to one another in the central canal of the spinal cord, which is a hole down the spinal cord, they create what again? The ventricles. Cerebral spinal fluid. They're lined with what are called epidymal cells, which create those, those are cuboidal to columnar shaped cells which have tight junctions which provide that blood brain barrier. Okay. Um, so there's different groupings of them. Oh good, I have a picture right there. Let's look at the picture first and then backtrack to the notes. And probably most of this is just going to be right in the notes. In each cerebral hemisphere, you have C-shaped, what are called lateral ventricles. Why don't we call them one and two? Because then we have three and four. Why don't we call them one and two, do you think? Why don't we just call them lateral? And then skip to third and fourth ventricle. Because they're the same. Yeah, nobody could decide who was going to be one or two, right? So they call them lateral ventricles. Those lateral ventricles connect down to what's called the third ventricle, okay? The third ventricle is a round-shaped structure, and it actually goes around the thalamus. Remember I showed you the thalamus on a picture a few slides ago? The thalamus, guys, is not just one round central structure. The thalamus is structured almost like a yo-yo. 
There's a round part to the right, there's a round part to the left, and they're connected, right? If you take that and transpose it to here, what you're seeing is this space that connects the thalamus. Around it is the third ventricle, okay? So we have lateral ventricles connecting down to third. The third connects to the fourth. The fourth is going to be in front of the cerebellum, the fourth ventricle, okay? The third and the fourth are connected by what's called the cerebral aqueduct. We're gonna re-go over all this in lab as well, okay? Okay, an aqueduct was what in Roman times? It carried water, okay? So they named this the cerebral aqueduct, carrying that cerebral spinal fluid from third to the fourth ventricle, okay? Lateral ventricles to third ventricle around the thalamus to, to the fourth ventricle in front of the cerebellum. At that point, it sends offshoots to go around the brain and the cerebellum, but it also comes down the center of the spinal cord. Okay, so it doesn't show that in this picture. Okay. You should know all the ventricles and cerebral aqueduct. That's what you should know at this point. Okay? So I think we covered, yeah. I think we covered all of that. Okay. Look at this for a second. Here's the frontal lobe, here's the occipital lobe. This is the front of the brain, this is the back of the brain. What gyrus is this? Pre-central gyrus, which controls what of the body? Motor. Motor. To the opposite side. Is this on one side of the brain or both? Both. both. I don't like this picture for that reason. People think it's on one side. It's not. They're showing you sensory on one side, motor on the other. Are you with me with that? Okay. It's on both sides. So the blue would be the what gyrus? Post-central gyrus, which senses what from the body? Sensory. This is something called the homunculus. The nerves that contribute to different areas of the body are represented on this picture by how big they are. And you may or not be able to see it well from where you are, but motor control of the face has way more nerves than motor control of your forearm. Do you see how, can you see that? Like in the back, okay. So the bigger it is representatively speaking on this picture, the more nerves are in that area, so you have better what? Better what? Control, right? You need better motor control of your face and your hands and your feet than you do your back muscles. Right? They just kind of hold you upright. Are you with me with that? Okay. Same thing with sensory. So that is called the homunculus. Does that make sense? So it's a representative picture of the nerve distribution. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I used to teach this. I just don't anymore. All the different, I, you know, if you're really interested, I can go over it with you. I just don't. I think it's an exercise of utility. I'd rather have you know adult brain and things that can go wrong with it. I do want you to know that embryologically speaking, we have um, the nervous system comes from what's called the ectoderm. Did I go over those different embryological layers of tissues? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. So, Really quickly, I'm going to tell this to you every time, and then we're going to go over embryology as a whole at the end. Do we start as little people, or do we start as layers of tissue? Right. And actually, we start as ball of cells and turn into layers of tissue. And those layers, and it's more complicated than this, of course. Oh, how does your book do it? Let me think for just a minute. They put ectoderm at the top. Okay, and 
then what happens with these three layers is they start to wrap around and fold and mold into a little body, okay? For the most part, ectoderm is going to be the nervous system, and believe it or not, the top layer of your skin, the way that it folds. Okay, ectoderm is gonna be nervous system, top layer of the skin. It folds in a very strange way. We'll go over it in the future. Endo means what? On the inside. Think of it as being the inside linings of your body. Mesoderm is skeleton and muscle. Okay, it's kind of the middle stuff. All right, just to give you a quick breakdown. The nervous tissues comes from ectoderm, okay? Ectoderm. As far as, far as those brain vesicles, we're not gonna get into that breakdown. Some people love to do that, I don't. Okay, and then, so don't worry about this either. Okay, cerebral hemispheres, know your lab anatomy, look at how thick the cerebral cortex is. This is where we process information, right? Gray matter processes information. I'm just looking ahead to see. very specific functions. We've already talked about two of them. Precentral gyrus is where we have what? Motor control of the body. Postcentral gyrus is sensory. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Broadman sat down and figured out there are 52 cortical areas in that gray matter in the cerebral cortex of your brain that have specific functions. So everybody say thank you, Dr. Shadow, for not making me memorize them all, okay? We're gonna go over a couple of specific ones, where they are and what they do, okay? So, we have motor, we know, sensory, but there's also association areas which just sort of help those areas along. For example, your primary vision is at the base of the skull. There's a visual association area which helps that along, okay? So there's primary areas and then association areas. Okay. There's a contralateral affiliation. That sounds like a big word. We already know what it is. That means the right brain controls. Contra means opposite. Opposite body, opposite sensory comes to the right brain. Okay, so contralateral. Most of the functions have a contralateral affiliation with what they do. There are some that are lateralized, which means just to one side, okay? The one that we're gonna talk about is speech, that's it. Speech primarily is found left-sided for us. There are some people that are right-sided, we're just gonna talk about left-sided, okay? So that's a lateralized function, that's the only one we'll talk about, okay? Is speech control and understanding. Are you with me, okay? Everything else will be opposite controlled, okay? Now we process these together on both sides though, why? What do we have that connects both sides? We have white matter. White matter sends and transmits information. We have millions of axons that control both sides. I'll tell you what that is in a little bit, okay? So here's the Broadman's areas. I'm gonna walk through them one by one. Motors in that pre-central gyrus in the frontal lobe, okay? Um, we also have language control, which is Broca's area. Now, for the most part, if I back up to that, okay? Here's the pre-central gyrus, which is motor control of the body. Broca's areas in this region, okay? And I have this in the notes, just listen. Bracus area is motor control of speech. If you have to head your bats, just like the spinal cord, motor is in the front of the brain, 
in the frontal lobe. Okay, if you have to hedge your bets, can't really think of any exceptions. What's going to be in the back of the brain? Sensory. So in that frontal lobe on the left side, we have Braca's area, which is motor control of speech. So if I have damage to that, I can um, understand speech, I can understand what I want to say, but guess what? Can't I can't say it properly. Okay? So those are the two motor areas that we'll talk about. Braca's and motor to the body. Well, there's also extrinsic eye muscles. I won't really ask you much about that. We'll go over those in the future in special senses. Okay? Sensory. Sensory will be in the post-central gyrus for the body. That's also known as the somatosensory cortex. I know that sounds like a big word, but somo means, soma means what? Body. Sensory is the body, from the body. Okay? Vision will be found at the base of the brain in the occipital lobe. Okay? Auditory is actually found in your temporal lobe, which is nice because it's right near your ears. That makes sense. Okay? Vision at the base of the brain is a big one to know. Okay. Uh, prefrontal cortex is a small area in the front of your cortex, which is your personality, your intellect, etc. Okay, long-term memory. Um, Wernicke is, is a sensory area, a little bit further back, just behind Broca's. Let me see if I have. Right here, okay? This is the sensory of vocalization, okay? So you can't really understand it well and you can't put words together. This actually happened to a friend of ours, so he could articulate, but nothing made sense, okay? So those two work together to form motor and the understanding of language and comprehensive thought. Well, not thought, but speech, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Well, I know this starts to get to a laundry list, but... Okay, olfaction is the sense of smell. We're actually going to bring that into different areas of the brain, part of the frontal lobe and actually part of the limbic system. We have a connection between the sense of smell and our emotions. Did you ever date someone who wore a specific perfume or cologne? Right, and you walk by everybody, everybody knows that one. And you walk, or your grandmother wore it, or you know, like my best friend wore a specific perfume. If I smell that, boom, I'm back in college thinking of my best friend, or the guy I dated in high school, or whatever. There's a strong, strong, strong affiliation with smell and emotional memory. Okay, so just a little side note, kind of a cool thing. Okay, sensory association areas. Oh, I went, I jumped around there. Um, general interpretation area, I'm not going to ask you much on that. Visceral association area is just kind of putting all these different sensations together. Don't worry about it. Okay? This is kind of cool. Um, there's a connection between both sides of the brain called the corpus callosum. Is it white or gray matter, guys? Gray matter. Right side, white it's white. Okay. So if it's white, it transmits information. It connects the two sides. Why would we want to do that? So both sides can work together, right? Just think of it. If you didn't have those connections, both sides wouldn't know what was going on. Um, the interesting thing that they'll do with this corpus callosum is they will cut it in people who have seizures. Um, and it stops the seizures, but then they can do things like comprehend uh, an object with their right eye, right? But if they close their right eye, they don't recognize it with their left. So they have some weird side effects from it, but to live a life without seizures probably is worth it for them. Okay, so the corpus callosum connects those two sides of the brain. There's a little story about it there, okay? Crisscross, we know this, right? Right brain are affiliated more with like music, visual imagery, etc. Left brain, math, logic, language. And they say this is correlated with handedness, right? If you're right-handed, you're more what? left-brained, right, and left-handed would be more right-brained, supposedly. I wish I was right-handed. I don't think it's, I think because the corpus callosum and the connection between the two, though, that 
kind of overrides this from what I've read on other studies. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So, white matter versus gray matter. White matter is white because it's myelinated. We went over that last time, right? Okay. Connects and sends information to both sides. We just talked to uh, talked about the corpus callosum, which is that C-shaped white matter that sends information to both sides, right? There's also something called the corona radiata, which is the white matter that connects our cerebral hemisphere down to our body. And it's all these white axons coming down. Okay. And somebody thought it looked like a crown, corona radiata. So it's white matter that will connect from the brain down to the body, okay, corona radiata. Now, gray matter is collections of cell bodies. It tends to look gray because we don't have myelin. There's groupings in the center of the brain called basal nuclei, the diencephalon, which is the thalamus and the hypothalamus and another structure. Um, and then the basal nuclei are a different subgroup, and the basal nuclei are what get damaged with Parkinson's, okay? And we'll, we'll go a little bit more into that. The cerebral cortex is what again? The outer layer of gray matter, right? Is everybody clear on that? If we take one cerebral hemisphere and we look at the outer portion, the thin rim on the outside is going to be gray. That's the cerebral cortex. Are we clear on that or not? Okay. I'm going to keep lecturing because I want to get through what we're going to get through on the test here. You're welcome to stay. I don't think it'll take me more than five or ten minutes to finish up. I know I'm going over. If you have to go, you can absolutely go. Just try to be quiet because we're trying to videotape the class. Okay? The test will go through um, making memories in these notes. Okay? The test will go through making memories or memories in the moonlight or something like that. Okay? So, if you want very quietly, you can take off if you have another class. Otherwise, I'm going to try to get through that. Okay? I don't think we have a time more to do. Okay. Diencephalon is going to be thalamus, hypothalamus, and what's called the epithalamus. Okay, the thalamus we looked at is that round structure. And I always think of it, have you guys watched the movie Men in Black? Where there's that little guy sitting in the center of the guy's brain. If you haven't, go watch it. And he transmits information up and down, right? From the brain to the body. That's why I think of the thalamus. Thalamus sits up in the brain, it receives information, and it tells where that sensory information should go in the brain. It's subdivided into little units called nuclei, and each nuclei has a specific job. Like there's specific nuclei for vision, there's specific nuclei for sensory. Okay, so they have a pathway and a specific job, and they say, oh, visual input, that way. <laughs> Hearing, that way you know, sensory from the body that way. So that's the primary job for the thalamus. Hypothalamus is below it. Um, it has many little subdivisions, heart rate, digestion, etc. cetera. Um, it talks to something called the pituitary gland, which is really called the master gland. It controls our hormones of our body. We're gonna talk about that completely on its own when we get into the endocrine system in AMP2. But the hypothalamus helps to regulate those hormones that come out of the pituitary. It's a very delicate balance. Okay? Hypothalamus also deals with olfactory relays. Okay, remember I told you there's that connection with emotions. It runs through these mammillary bodies. And it's called mammillary bodies because it looks like breasts. And ironically enough, in the human brain, those breasts are right above the fat ponds. <laughs> So it does look like a pregnant female, okay? Infundibulum is the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Once again, we're gonna completely go over that in endocrine, so don't, don't worry if it doesn't make sense. So hypothalamus regulates all these other things which you can read on your own. Epithalamus is this cool little structure in the back of the brain, okay? It's the last part of this diencephalon, and it releases melatonin. And what does um, melatonin do for us? makes you sleepy, okay? So as you get towards nighttime, this um, epithalamus, really known as pineal gland, people call it, will release melatonin and it's what makes you sleepy, okay? 
So diencephalon. Any questions about that? No? Okay. Brainstem. It's going to be the three parts, midbrain, pons, medulla, oblongata. We've talked about their functions, and we'll look at those in lab and go over those functions again as well. This is the area that can be damaged if we have upper cervical damage. Okay. Cerebellum coordinates movements of the body. It's that funky little lobe underneath the occiput. Um, it is what is damaged when you drink too much and your reflexes are slowed and your coordinated movements. Um, there's two lobes, just like we have two cerebral hemispheres, connected by what's called a vermis. It's just a little tongue-like protection between them. It also has waves, just like we have in the cerebral hemisphere. Even more, when you look at it, you'll see it's much thinner little waves to increase um, surface area because coordination sets an important function for us. Okay. Functional brain systems. Limbic system um, is super duper complicated. So what I want you to know for our purposes at this level is limbic system equals emotions. Okay. There's like 10 different structures with many different functions, but realize that limbic system deals with emotional reactions. Reticular formation is actually going to be in the brain stem itself. Reticular formation is an important structure to know because this is what is subdued when we are put under anesthesia. Anesthesia affects these areas to take away our state of consciousness. But if we damage this area, guess what you go into? Coma. Okay. So it's not like one particular, like the pons, it's a series of white matter that runs through that brain stem, okay, and it's affiliated gray matter, okay? Higher mental functions, what's going on in there? Okay, gray brain patterns and electroencephalogram. Um, do we know what that is? EEG studies brain wave patterns. We're actually going to do it in lab. So there's different brave wave patterns that we should have according to our states of awareness. Okay, and an EEG can monitor this. Why would we want to do an EEG on someone? A lot of the times the older patients in nursing homes have to have them because like you want to see what they think, like how they're thinking. How they're working. thinking and how they're functioning. Right. If you're awake and alert, you should have a certain brave wave brave wave pattern. If that's not showing that way, there could be a difference or a difficulty with their state of awareness, right? Also, if someone has seizures, to see the electrical activity. Okay, so sleep. They do studies on, um, they've done some cool studies on people who meditate, and the brave brain, but why do I say I can say like hypothalamus easily, but brave, brain, I still can't brain say, wave. brain wave pattern. Right? And people who meditate can calm down. Okay? So it's kind of a cool little thing. Okay? Types of brain waves, you can read that on your own. I will never ask you those numbers. Okay? I'll ask you more what should be happening when and sort of what they should look like. You know, is it quicker and faster when we're awake and alert? Sure is. Right? Is it big, deep waves when we're in deep sleep? Absolutely. Okay, that's more what I'm looking for. I don't care if you know the numbers or not. I'm not good at remembering numbers. I don't expect you to. Okay? So like beta. Beta is awake and alert. We're going to have more activity. Alpha is awake but relaxed. Like if you go home and meditate for a little bit, you're going to have less frequent waves. Beta is common in children. It's uncommon in adults. You're going to have more irregular, less frequent waves. And with delta, I always think delta deep sleep because you get these nice deep waves. Okay? So I think that kind of makes sense. We're going to try to elicit what in lab? What should be there? Two choices in lab. Alpha and beta. Alpha and beta. Okay? So when we meet again in lab next week, maybe or the week after, we'll try to do this. <coughs> Epilepsy is a torrent of electrical discharges at varying intensity that will change that brainwave pattern, okay? Right? 
they can vary seizures, just so you know, from something called, um, you know, petite mal. Do I have that up there? I do. Okay, petite mal to grand mal. And um, I actually had a friend who had petite mal seizures, and she would literally be talking to me and just stop. And then she would start again. And that was her seizure. But it's called petite because petite means what? Small. Small. And then she would function and be fine all the way to grand mal. And grand mal is, they call it tonic clonic. They assume that posture with the head back and the arms and legs straight. Um, quite often with people like that, they have to wear like a helmet to protect their head. But some cool things that has been happening for several years is they actually have dogs that can smell it coming or sense it coming. And they're trained. They do this with people who have diabetes as well. It's amazing. And these dogs have clues and signals to tell that person they're going either into diabetic ketoacidosis or a seizure. I think it's just lay down. Like if the dog stops, sits, and lays down, that person with a grand mal seizure knows they have to lay down because they're going to go into a seizure and they don't want to get head trauma. So cool. Dogs are cool, aren't they? <laughs> anyway, okay. So grand mal, um, you know, they can have loss of bell and bladder. They can bite their tongue. They used to say to stick something in there, don't do that, because they can bite it off and choke on it. You just want to support their head and, and be there for them, and just mostly after be there for them, because it's got to be scary. So an aura can occur before that. An aura means that there is either a smell or visual disturbance. I had a patient who had this before she had migraines, and she would smell cigarette smoke, believe it or not. That's one aura that you have before a migraine, right? Uh, oranges, burnt toast. It's just something that they smell. Are they really smelling it? No. But something in their brain triggers, and they get this aura beforehand. Visuals are very common, too. I heard it's more like a sensation, like an actual feeling, and so you can feel something impending. Oh yeah, absolutely. They know when it's going to happen. So that period is, is called a quorum. Okay? What is a seizure? Is it like a chemical imbalance? It's, it's chemical. Well, it's going to be like neurochemical because they're sending those action potentials that aren't regulated on a regular basis, and it kind of gets like cyclical and out of control. So. Isn't like like seizures like teacher old teacher explained it to me as like electric, mm -hmm. and then the stroke was explained as like imbalance or something. But it's still neurotransmitters, which are chemical. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, it's not my specialty. It could absolutely be true, but it's still a neurochemical that's released with them as well. Okay, anti-convulsive drugs. There's something called a vagus nerve stimulator, which is kind of cool that calms the nervous system. We'll learn about vagus nerve in the future. Okay, fainting is, uh, or syncope, is a decrease in blood pressure where you can pass out because you don't have enough blood and oxygen going to the brain. Okay, coma, there's different stages of awareness. You know, coma, obviously, is when you're completely unconscious. All right, let me see, can I see the notes for just a second? I want to see how much further I want to get to get through the first picture. And or if you can, oh, there's only, it's going, so your first midterm, and really, you can read through the rest of this up to and including memories all alone in the, mid, in the moonlight, like right about consciousness and sleep, okay, and that's pretty easy stuff. So I'm going to have you do a couple of slides on your own since it's almost 11.30 and I have to give an exam at 11.30. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for hanging in with me. So finish up to and including memories in the moonlight. That'll be on your first exam. Maybe one question on sleep anyway. I don't ask you a ton on sleep. All right? So those are easy. Of course, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you for staying over with me. I will see you guys in two weeks. Unless I have you in lab, I will see you in two minutes.